y'all know what peer pressure is, but you know I gotta give you a refresher definition. I mean, look, to me, there's one side and, and then the safe side, and I just, I just wanna stay on the safe side, uh, just in case, if you will. But peer pressure is the pressure that you feel to behave in a certain way because your friends or people in your group expect it. It can be a very powerful force too. When I think back to my teenage days, I can remember that feeling and the fear that, well, wouldn't anyone think I was cool? Or do I fit in with the lit crowd? And that fear led me to do a lot of stupid things that I know in my heart probably wouldn't have done otherwise. As an adult though, peer pressure does not go away. David, in today's story, finds that to be very true. Remember where we've been in this story so far. We've already been introduced to Saul. Saul continued to be jealous of David. He hunted him and tried to kill him. In this story, we see Saul entering a cave and he's all alone. Many people in David's situation would have found many excuses to justify killing Saul. David's men who was running with him applied extreme peer pressure on him. This is a God-given opportunity and you should take it. Or even, we're just so tired of running around and fighting Saul. This can all end right now. How did David handle that pressure? In our question of the hour, why do we cave into peer pressure? What a tremendous question. Why do I cave into peer pressure? Well, the answer is probably very simple and very obvious, but how do we get out of it is what we're gonna talk about today. The, the answer to that question is probably because we're people pleasing sometimes. We, we just wanna fit in with the crowd. Uh, we we want to be liked. We have so we some of us um, kind of create a performance-oriented lifestyle, and it's like if I do all of this and fit in with you, will you like me? I mean, all of that really it's it's pressure. We all we all feel it, and it continues throughout all of life. It may be around drugs or alcohol when you're young, but that can continue into your later years. People put pressure on you and say, you got to fit in. Hey, let's just, let's unwind and have some fun. And, uh, or it may be, how many followers do you have in, in your socials? And so you, you kind of feel that kind of pressure. Or it may be to join in with the bullying. And it's like you hear some gossip about somebody and you, you join in with it. But it, it continues throughout life. Some of us probably go after and we're, we're stressed about money because we want to retire because nobody's ever said it to us. Us, but you feel it. It's like, but if I don't retire there, then I haven't arrived. And it's all really, if you boil it down, it's people pleasing. It's, it's try, it's a bit of peer pressure. There's a lot of social peer pressure around us in society today. And we don't even sometimes call it that, nor do we realize it when it's not, you know, people saying, you have to do it, and you, you know, when it's really aggressive, but it's a subtle undertone of our culture today. And that spirit of people pleasing is all around us. And so today we're going to look at where David is completely under the gun with peer pressure. It's uh, as we've been seeing last week, we watched him on the run. And I want to be real clear about peer pressure. I'm talking about the negative peer pressure. There is positive peer pressure when it's accountability for your soul, a brother or sister in Christ who really is encouraging you to live for the, the, um, the holiness of Christ. But I'm talking about the negative peer pressure that just pulls you into stress and chaos. Much like last week, we talked about running and why do I run from my problems? Well, sometimes when you're in an abusive situation, you need to run at first to get away. I'm talking about the negative side to these questions. And so the idea of, boy, the, the pressure that comes at me. Saul, the king, is very jealous of David. We saw it last week, we saw it the week before, and it's continuing now because, again, David was anointed king, but it's still 20 years of on the run. God is patient to bring him into a place of authority. And so David is hiding out in caves, and that's where we find him today. And he's, when we watch him feel the pressure where he caves to peer pressure in some ways, but it's awesome to watch how he handles it, and maybe it will help you in your story. In fact, um, today we're going to build toward two questions, and if you'll really have the courage to ask these and, and answer these questions, you will be able to overcome the peer pressure that comes against you and the undertones of people-pleasing in your life. So again, Saul is jealous of David, and he brings military men, 3,000 of them after David. David now has been on the run and he's actually starting to connect with a variety of people. 
and he finds about 600 men. And so you've got 3,000 against 600. And here's where it's not fair. The 3,000 of Saul, they're all military trained, fed well, strong food. They're ready to really take on anybody. These 600 men with David are all outcasts from society. They're ones who have left Jerusalem or have, have run away from their problems. And they're, they're probably, a lot of them probably have mental issues. They're probably, they're not very healthy at times and they're misfits. I consider them to be like a band of misfits. And now that's David's army. Again, you want to talk about David and Goliath, if you will. That's kind of how it is. And so now we'll see David come under tremendous pressure. In fact, I want to give us the, the kind of the big picture here today by first talking about the three types of pressure that David feels. And it's possible you may feel this as well. The first one is really a relational pressure. And so you've got these 600 band of misfits that are saying, we've got to take out Saul. We've got to really, we, you've got to take the throne. We know that you're anointed this way. Come on, David. And so we pick up, we're going to hang out. Last week we saw as in, in our Bible reading, which I encourage you to join us in the Bible reading, go to our app. Um, you, you can find um, programs out in the, the hub as well, um, but online you can find it for sure. First Samuel 24. So we looked at last week, first Samuel 20 through 23. Today we pick up at verse one of first Samuel 24. When Saul returned from the Philistines, he was told, behold, we found him. David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 uh, chosen men, so like the elite, out of all of Israel. And he went to seek after David and his men in front of the wild goat rock, in the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds where there was a cave. And Saul went in there to relieve himself. Now I have to pause there for a minute. That's kind of funny. <laughs> so we find Saul on the throne. Yes, I did go there. Had to go there for a moment. Um, but there's tremendous pressure kind of coming at David where these men are like, he went in there and he's still in there. Clearly he's not number one. He's on the throne. He's, you know, so there's this tension that's building and all that. And they're like, you got to get him. David is feeling tremendous relational pressure in this moment. Absolutely. And so you can picture these men. It's like, this is our moment. David, thank God for what's happening in this moment. It's so loaded. Well, it gets worse than that. The very next verse shows a second type of pressure, a spiritual pressure. And I got to tell you, spiritual pressure is extremely intense and we all can feel that one from time to time. And here's what I mean by that. The very next verse, uh, the second half of verse three. David and his men were far back in the cave. So they hid in the cave while Saul goes in, uh, you know, for his thing. And the men said, this is the day that the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Sounds holy to me. There's only one problem. Nowhere in the scriptures is this verse found. These men made up a Bible verse is what they did. The Lord told us that he's gonna give the enemy into your hands. This is why we're so adamant at Cornerstone about spiritual development. We believe in corporate gathering. We believe in corporate we, life groups, support groups. We want to grow together in faith. Um, but you also have to walk in a discerning spirit. Because sometimes even Christians can go off the rails and give bad advice. And I've heard sometimes people say, the Lord told me to tell you. And, and they're just flat out wrong. And I, I say this with a caution in my spirit because I want nothing more than for us to have good counsel from one another and to listen to each other's advice. When we confess sin to one another, we find healing. The Bible's very clear about that. So the power of brotherly and sisterly love in the faith is very, very important. But we need to take responsibility for the conviction of our spirit as well. Because God speaks to us through a variety of ways. One is through the Holy Spirit's power. The Holy Spirit will give you promptings and you just know when you know that your conscience is like 
I, you know that gut instinct that you have? That's a God-given gift from, from, from your creator to you that you'll be guided by the Spirit of God. The same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead speaks and lives within your spirit. And to own that is a very important principle here that we learn with David. I mean, because can you imagine the pressure he's feeling? Well, the Lord must say so. And he could have justified, there's Saul right there in the cave. His men are outside and he's, he's just kind of relaxed for a minute. Perfect opportunity to kill him and to cause mutiny within the whole, to all of Israel. And he could have taken the throne. He could have staged a coup right there. Had he listened to this godly advice, but they weren't speaking truth. They were speaking of their own agenda. Pretty much, there's tons of pressure around that. I, I, uh, um, I hear frequently um, pressure that comes against people. I'll, I'll give you an example that I've heard uh, actually on several occasions, but one recently of, of a, a young female who she said, my boyfriend who was a Christian, and I put air quotes really, because you know a person by their fruit. He said, love, love is love, honey. And, and he put all this pressure on me and he said, God is love. And he convinced me to go further in this relationship than I wanted to. And she just felt so much brokenness in her spirit because she gave in to spiritual pressure. We can use people and we can use the scriptures for our own gain. And these men did that. And David was filled with wisdom in this moment. So we need to take responsibility for the pressures that come against us and the decisions that we make. This victim mentality that our culture celebrates today, it's always about victim, victim, victim. And I get that and I'm, I'm not putting that down, but I'm also saying we need to be cautious about that because we do need to support and defend and protect victims, I understand that. But when we default to that and say, I made a bad choice because she made me do it. That's when it gets so dangerous. We need to take responsibility for, wait a minute, you put pressure on me and you tried to give me godly advice, but I knew in my conscience it wasn't a good move. We, we test all of these together. And, and when God is speaking, your, your, friend, your, your brother and sister in the Lord, yourself, um, circumstances will all line up. But when they're contrary to each other, then that's where you just say, can we just hit a pause button? And, and David... I wonder, started to hit the pause button. In fact, I'll, I'll kind of prove that to you because we watch David here with the third type of pressure, situational pressure, situational pressure coming at him. So he's got the relational pressure of these guys. He's got the spiritual pressure. God gave him into our hands. Praise the Lord. And now truly situational. He's right there. David, when will you get another opportunity than this? Go kill him. And that's the pressure on him. It is intense. Thank the Lord for the scriptures give us lots of insight and backstory, especially in the Psalms. That's why I'm loving this series because 70 of the Psalms, of the 150 Psalms, 70 of them were written by David. And you've been hearing me say the Psalms are like a journal entry. So we have a chance to hear David's thoughts in the cave. And Psalm 142, I'm just going to flip over there. Um, for a moment, and then I'll come back to 1 Samuel 24. Um, but you can write this down for yourself. I'll put it up on the screen as well. I want to show you um, some of David's thoughts. And this psalm, it literally says, David in the cave. So we don't even have to question. Like nobody debates. It's like David in the cave. Okay, we know what he's thinking. So he's journaling about this moment and this, this season of his life. I'm jumping into verses three and four of Psalm 142. And, and you can read this later for yourself in more detail. This is David's inner thoughts about his loneliness. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. So I think he's referring to Saul and the enemy, those guys, even though they're all from Israel. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me, I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. He's got 600 men around him and he's alone? Absolutely. In fact, I would dare say the loneliest place sometimes you can ever be is in a crowd when you don't go along with the crowd. 
Have you ever been at a place where you're like, I don't fit in right now. And the pressure is heavy to look like they look and act like they act. And you've got all this pressure on you and it's just ugly. What do you do in those moments? Well, I'm about to get there. We're almost there. But David was feeling exactly what we feel. I don't fit in. I'm all alone. And when you don't go along with the crowd, you just don't fit in. Well, so what did David do? Well, I love looking at scripture in context. I just took two verses and didn't show you the full context. Let me read the rest of it around it. I'm going to reread. Let's go back to verses one and I'm going to look through five. Keep reading here. Back to Psalm 140. It's hanging out in verse Psalm 142. I cry aloud to the Lord. So David is like, Lord, I don't have any friends. These 600 men are not safe. They're not giving me good counsel. So I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. God, I'm all alone, right? I lay out before him all of my, I tell him all of my trouble. Boy, that's important. I hope you do that. I hope you do that. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you, God, who watch over my way. And then this is what I just read. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there's no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord, and I say, but you are my refuge. You are my portion in the land of the living. So David is under terrible pressure. He's under relational and spiritual and situational pressure. And he's just overwhelmed. So what did he do? Well, he did what we've seen a couple of times during this series so far. He called out to the Lord. And this is a great thing. Like, God, I'm alone. I'm, I'm in this crowd and I don't fit in. And I, maybe you feel this way at work and there's always a negative spirit and you're trying to bring light into the darkness. Several years ago, we, we did a Elevate the Room series. And it was, it was literally just about how, how you're to bring light in the darkness. And you're saying, man, that's hard. And I just feel the constant pressure. Like, I don't fit in and I, I just... Oh, I don't know what to do with it. Well, David was feeling all of that, very alone. But as he called out to God, God gave him wisdom and insight. And, and uh, well, let's, let's get into it. I want to um, now go over to, uh, I'm going to keep going. Oops, uh, over here on uh, 1 Samuel 24, now back to verse 4. So David's under pressure, and he does what I hope all of us will do, cry out to God. Help me, God. Verses 4 and 5. Then David... Uh Uh-oh, is he going to give in to the pressure? He creeps up unnoticed behind Saul. And he cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Let me pause there. We're going to keep going in just a second. I, you've probably, if you've ever read this before, you're like, okay, I, I, what is it? Is it a pride thing? He's trying to show off. What does this mean? Uh, this is a prayer shawl that I picked up in Israel, and it, it's similar to what would be on the, the hem of a king's robe and, uh, in, in Israel, a Jewish robe. And what you have at the corner of each of, of, the, uh, of um, the corners of a robe, you have tassels that are known as seatzies. A seatzi is, um, there's five knots which represent the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the, the five books uh, in the, um, of the Torah. So now you have um, to, like a prayer shawl, if you will, and the tassel. And he, most scholars believe he clipped off that corner. This represented authority. This represented power. This represented, like, this was his his source of, like, I matter in the seat of authority. And so he was cutting off him as a leader. Very significant moment. And so, because you could read that and say, David, why are you crying? You just cut off a clip. It's not like you, you cut him and you stabbed the side of him or, you know, you jabbed him. Like, you didn't inflict harm. Well, he, he inflicted psychological harm, spiritual harm, emotional harm. Because this was a, a very significant moment and, and a very significant symbol uh, in this moment. So, uh, David, I, I believe, was like... He came to the line. 
See, peer pressure and people pleasing has a way of just being so vindictive and manipulative that you feel this pressure between the social pressure of of society and the conscience of your heart. And so David did what I think a lot of us do. Well, I'll go to the party, I just won't drink. I'll, I'll, I'll go out and hang out with those people that I know are, not, are a bad influence. However, I, I just, I won't, you know, I, I'll, I'll behave when I'm there. Like you come up to the line and David like comes to the line and it's almost like he puts his toe over the line. He didn't kill him. So he, he still had a conscience, and he's, but he's, he's feeling the weight of the pressure of these men. Go get him. God gave you this moment. Go get him. And he, and, he, and he does, but he doesn't. Like, oh, so much tension in his spirit. And if you're human at all, you feel this in life. You just do to fit in, to try to keep up. I mean, you, you, somebody gets something like celebratory and you're like, oh, now I've got to do that. They go on a bigger vacation, like it's so hard to look at social media because you're like, they did that and they did that. Oh man, and you feel this pressure. And like, and so you start pushing yourself and you're loaded with all this stress and all you're doing is getting up close to the line. All the while, you know, you know like, why do I try to please people? It just hurts me and it causes me so much stress. Why, what is it within me? Well, David's feeling all of it right now. Well, there's a question that I believe kept David from going the whole line and killing Saul. I believe he was asking a question like this. This is question number one of the two I want to give to you. The first question is this. If I follow the crowd, will I still be me? Never compromise you for them. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, you know who you are. I've, I've heard uh, people say at different times, like, I don't know why I got drunk. I don't know. I, that wasn't the real me. Or you give into the pressure to pile on to somebody and you just, you add to the negative spirit in the room and, and you just join in and you're like, that's not the real me. And you're like, well, then why didn't you ask the question? If I join in, am I the real me? I want you to be the real me all the time, especially in times of pressure. David cried when he cut off the seat Z of of Saul because the real him knew, I don't want to harm the king. And so he knew in his spirit the right thing to do, but the peer pressure just kind of catapulted him there. And have you ever gotten to the point where you're like, How did that escalate so fast? Well, because you just went along with it. But inside you knew, this isn't me. This isn't me. I shouldn't be here. Why am I doing this? I don't know. And and then you're like, I just crossed the line. Because you weren't asking the question, if I follow the crowd, will I be me? It's great to follow the crowd when when it's the real you. And if it's it's a matter of sin, then at that point you need to repent of sin. But if you're with a a good crowd of people that they're giving you good, solid peer pressure of saying, hey, let's let's go serve in our community. Let's go love on our neighbors. Let's go share the gospel of Christ with people. That's good peer pressure. You're like, I wouldn't go do that on my own. But the real me is I want to share my faith. And my, my friends are giving me peer pressure in this positive way. And you're like, the real me wants this. And so you, that's a good kind of peer pressure. Like if I give into this peer pressure, if I follow the crowd, will I really be me? That's a vital, vital question. And I believe David in his heart, he knew, I don't want to hurt the king. I don't want to hurt the king. I know I deserve the throne and I know he's not a healthy man. And I know he's not leading the, this um, country well. How many times have we tried to overthrow our boss because they are just so unhealthy and it's like, I could run this place better than you. And so then you start to get a crowd of people that say, yeah, yeah, you know, let's, let's make sure we go to the board and tell them how bad their person is or whatever it is, you know? And you just feel all the tension that starts to rise. It's, it's all around us. And, and that's peer pressure and it's, it's like crazy. So David is, uh, you know, you just watch this, you know, this giving in and stuff and, it reminds me of uh, Cornerstone here. We've got a bunch of kids, juniors and seniors, as we get to David again, um, that uh, just went to Mexico. 
uh, over Christmas. And some of them actually felt peer pressure to be like, why would you go on a mission trip for your only, only vacation? Like you gotta, it's Christmas time. We gotta go have fun and you're going on a mission trip? What are you doing? And they, they, didn't, they didn't fall for the peer pressure of society. They went and gave of themselves during their only break of the winter. Like how cool is that? And, and next Sunday, they're on February 4th, they're gonna be sharing their testimony. Come check it out. Uh, right over in base camp to hear a bunch of kids that said, we're not gonna give into that peer pressure. I'm so proud of them. It's just fantastic. So that's where we see David now. He's got this peer pressure and he, he's conscience stricken and he's like, all this pressure's coming at him and does he choose wisely in all of this? Well, picture this. I'm gonna keep going, verse six. We're just continuing verse by verse. David faced 600 bloodthirsty men. And this is what he says. He said to his men, right after he cut off the hem of his robe, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. I can picture these men like, David, you're such a wimp. Uh, to do things such a, to my master, the Lord's anointed, or to lay my hand upon him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply re rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. How, how, did he, how did David stop from this peer pressure from the 600 men? Very simply, I think in his spirit, he said, it wouldn't be me. It wouldn't be me to go along with that. It wouldn't be me to kill him. If I kill him, I'm gonna bring a, a spirit of assassination to Israel. And I would be king, then I would look over my shoulder for the rest of my life. I'm gonna trust God. I'm going to say, Lord, you're going to be the one that will establish my authority. I trust you. Like, this is a beautiful story of faith. And that's a good lesson for all of us. When you feel in your conscience, I shouldn't give in with the peer pressure I'm feeling at any age to literally say, Lord, I want to be able to say, I'm going to trust you to protect my reputation because I don't want my reputation hurt by these people. I, res I respect them, but they're asking me to do something I shouldn't do. It's immoral, it's illegal, I don't wanna do it. And so, but if I, if I don't go along with it, I may get fired or I, what am I gonna do? This is a purest form of faith. God, protect my reputation. These 600 men were probably not healthy, I mean it. They were misfits, they were, a, they were not a part of the culture. They were just hiding out in caves and he brings them all together and they could easily kill David right now. But David said, I'm gonna trust God. I'm gonna trust my conscience. And it's beautiful. Well, the story goes on. You'll read it for yourself this week in the Bible reading. Uh, David goes to King Saul and he holds it up and he, hey, Day, or, or David goes to Saul, hey, Saul, before you leave, he comes out of the cave with his 600 men. There's 3,000 men over there. And he holds up the seat Z in the, the corner of the hem of the garment. And he, I could have killed you. It's quite interesting. Saul immediately starts crying. I don't want to give the story away. You can read it for yourself, but he's like, David, you're amazing. And it's like a beautiful moment. And you think they're going to be best friends and they are best friends for a moment. And then next week we'll see him chase him again, you know, cause he's kind of loony, loony in that way. But it, it like, cause that's human nature. You know, I love you today. I'm going to hate you tomorrow. And so for every mountaintop, there's a valley. And right now this moment of David brings Saul to repentance. It's a great story. You can read it for yourself. But I want to, I want to kind of come in for a landing by asking you the most important question of the day. And question number two, I'm going to flip over and we're going to land on Galatians 1.10. But I want to ask you this question. David, in this moment, um, I believe this is the greatest question you can ask yourself. When you're under peer pressure, which me do I really want to be? What do I mean by that? This whole story is loaded with the dichotomy of flesh and spirit, good and evil, light versus darkness. Which me? do I want to be? Galatians 1.10 says this, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. You see, Jesus, when he said, count the cost before you follow me, because if you follow me, I'm gonna ask you to die to yourself. I'm gonna ask you to take the high road 
away from the ways of the world, and the ways of the world will always take you into darkness. Which me do I want to be? Do I want to live for and be a servant of Christ, as it says in Galatians here, or do I want to be a servant of my own agenda, which is to be liked by everybody, or to be a people pleaser, you name whatever it is. This is, uh, this is um, complicated because uh, people have so much power. They just do. Your tribe. There's nothing worse than feeling like your tribe. You know the people that you respect, the people that you're like, I want to be like them. That tribe has power. And if you don't go along with them, it starts in grade school, goes into high school and college to try to keep up with everybody and stay ahead. And, and then it definitely gets into the workplace, gets into church, gets everywhere. Like we, tr- we show off to each other so much. How do you get set free from that? Well, it's the question. Which me do I want to be? Do, do you really want to be a servant of Christ? Then Jesus says, you got to pick one or the other. You can't please both. What are you going to choose? I, I want to uh, kind of wrap and land in here t- with a story that was probably one of the most life-defining moments of my, of my story around the issue of people-pleasing. And it really set me free. I, I, I've shared before that I, uh, I always got bad grades in speech class. Um, my lowest grades in seminary and in my doctorate program were in, were in preaching. My, my, seriously, my, preach, my, my professors always thought I was not going anywhere in the preaching department. They just did. And uh, um, it goes way back to, this is almost 30 years ago. I was in seminary, and um, I, my wife and I, we didn't have kids at the time, and we were just serving in youth group and helping it out while I was studying to be a potential pastor one day. And we were at a retreat. It was a middle school retreat, and the kids were great. We bonded with them. We loved them. It was great. It was in Lexington, Kentucky. It was just so much fun. And we got, um, we got to the end of the weekend retreat, and we all kind of gave testimony. And these kids were having, many of them came to Christ. It was powerful, wonderful time. And, and uh, each of the leaders got a chance to get up and speak into the kids' lives. And um, this um, computer engineer gets up. And I'm like, he's a computer engineer. I can definitely out-preach him. I mean, he's, he's in a, a cave writing code all day. He can't, and he gets up there and he says, kids, this is the most amazing event I've ever seen. So many of you have come to Christ. The angels are rejoicing in heaven right now. And the kids start crying and they jump up. Yeah, they're rejoicing. We're celebrating. And it was awesome. And I wanted to repent and become a Christian again. Like, I want the angels rejoicing over me. It was such a great moment. And I still can see his face. Because he was, he was like, okay, I'm, I'm this preacher. I'm going in my master's degree at that time to become a preacher. And I get up there and I start, this overwhelming sense of fear came over me. And I'm like, I can't top that. Comparison destroys joy. Did you know that? You know, and it did in this moment. And my lips started quivering. Have you ever had that happen? They're like, oh, you know, like it was, I was so nervous and I, and I lost all train of thought. And I just said, Jesus loves you. And so do I. And I sat down. I mean, it was pathetic. My wife is sitting over there. She remembers. She was like, well, we gotta, we gotta learn how to live on rice and beans because we ain't going to make it in preacher life, you know? And so all this tension of me and, um, This is embarrassing to admit out loud, but I didn't obey last week's sermon in this story. I ran away. I dropped out of being a youth leader uh, for the rest of that year after that event. It was that humiliating to me because it mattered so much to me what these kids thought. Um, In fact, one of the kids in the group uh, was one of my professor's kids, and I was just so embarrassed. It was going to get back to the dad and all that, and then the professor was going to give me an F. You can't, you know, you did so bad speaking. And I mean, that's the lies that happen in your head around people pleasing and the pressure that just destroys you. And so we ran away and I literally the next six months, we weren't a part of it. We just kind of faded out. And then one day I've changed everything because God is good and God will, God will restore your heart. And I was still praying, God, am I called to be a pastor? What am I supposed to do with life? I just, in moments of pressure, I fail. Why am I going to do this, God? And, and I was sitting at a grocery store, and I see Jeremy, one of the kids. 
Ken! He yells down the aisle. It's a cereal aisle, and I grab Fruity Pebbles to try to hide, you know, like, save me, Fred Flintstone, you know, and I'm hiding. And he's like, Ken, is that you? And I remember as vividly as this moment right now, and he came up to me. Hey, Jeremy, how you doing? And that happened to be Jeremy is my professor's son. And I'm like, oh, geez, rub it in, you know. Are you here to tell me how bad I am? And, and he said, Ken, you wouldn't believe. I don't know where you went, but dude, this has been the most amazing six months of my life. Ken, you'll never believe it. And with the next words, it changed my life. He said, Ken, it was just like you said at the retreat. The angels are rejoicing <laughs> over me. As God is my witness, he said that. (laughs) Are you kidding me? There is a psychological effect. It's called the spotlight effect. The spotlight effect is the belief that everywhere you go, everybody pays attention to everything you do. Y'all have it. You're wondering what they're thinking about. And so you go to bed at night saying, I made a fool of myself. All the while, they're going to bed wondering, I made a fool of myself. And they're not thinking about you. And man, did that set me free. I have never been the same since. It was the greatest statement ever said in my life around the issue of people pleasing. And I believe that was from God himself speaking into my soul, letting me know who I am as a child of God. Who do you want to be in those moments? And if I had known that then, I would have just said, they're going to remember it wrong anyway. I just messed up in the speech. But of course, they're going to remember it wrong anyway. So why am I trying to please people who are going to forget or remember me wrong anyway? So I want to live differently in this world. And from that point on, I've been set free. I'm not afraid of you guys anymore. (laughs) I can walk in my own skin and be proud of who I am and who Christ made me to be because I'm a unique child of God and you are as well. When will you embrace that and say, I'm not, I don't want to be that when I follow the crowd. But sometimes the crowd in Christ's way will call you into places of a calling where you go, okay, I'm buckling up because I want to be that. But you got to answer that for yourself. And that's the challenge of the series. It's not just preaching. Like this is a, supposed to be a self-reflection to say, who am I and who am I becoming? I want you to be somebody that doesn't give into the peer pressure that is negative. I want you to give into the callings that we have together as a Christ following body. Because then when we all come alive, it changes the world because we're walking in freedom, comfortable in our own skin, knowing I am a child of God that Jesus died for. And that changes everything. So I want to pray over you on this. And we're going to sing this song, Child of God. And we're going to sing it with gusto because we're going to claim who we are. Because if you're falling for the lies of peer pressure, it stops today because of who Jesus Christ is and who he is in you. So I'm going to invite the band to come out. Let's sing and praise God in this incredible truth. Thank you, God, for the messiness of Scripture, the messiness of David, the tension that he must have felt, and yet the resurrection that happened within him as he stepped up against those 600 men and truly declared that he was going to follow your ways. And because of that, I pray each one of us can do the exact same thing. I know there's pressure at work, pressure at school, pressure in the neighborhood, pressure in the family to just be something that we don't feel we should be. I pray, God, that you'll give us courage to just be who we are made to be by you. I pray that we'll embrace your image, your likeness in our spirit that you'll take us to only places you can. And so I pray your anointing upon us as we declare this song of being and declaring that we are a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your resurrection power in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.